how does your phone know where you are? No, really, how can this five inch metal box determine your exact location to within just a few yards? Well, back in the 1970s, the United States military wanted a robust and stable way to be able to quickly and accurately determine the locations of things like boats and planes and submarines. So, in 1978, NASA sent a 4,000 pound satellite into orbit, equipped with an extremely accurate atomic clock. Now, a couple weeks ago, I made a video on how atomic clocks work, so if you haven't seen that video, I encourage you to go check it out. Very interesting. Then, over the next 17 years, NASA sent several more satellites into orbit until they had a fully functional 24 satellite system with four satellites in six separate orbits around Earth. But how does sending 24 satellites into space tell you anything about where you are? Now, your phone or GPS device uses a process called trilateration to determine your location. You need to receive a signal from at least four different satellites. Now, the reason there are 24 satellites in orbit around the Earth is so that no matter where you are, you can always get a signal from at least four different satellites. If there were fewer than 24, then it would be difficult for your phone to receive a signal from at least four. Also, considering that radio waves can't travel through the Earth, and so the satellites need to be above you. But what does your phone do with these signals? And more importantly, what are these signals? Now, these signals are radio waves, the same waves used in radio, television, air traffic control, remote control toys, and cell phones. Now, radio waves are part of what is called the electromagnetic spectrum, or the spectrum of light. You can look forward to a future video I'll be making on the electromagnetic spectrum, but for now, all you need to know is that radio waves are a type of light that we humans can't see, a type of invisible light. And that's all radio waves are, invisible light. Our eyes can't see it, but that doesn't mean our phones can't detect it. But again, what does our phone do with all these random signals coming from the sky? Imagine a world where Ryan here wants to find out where he is. He knows he's somewhere in Ryan's world, but he doesn't know where exactly. Now this is where I come in. Pretend that I am a satellite orbiting around Ryan's world. Now with me, I carry a messenger, this basketball. So what I can do is write down exactly what time it is. 12, 24, and zero seconds. Now I'm gonna roll this ball over to Ryan. Now Ryan's gonna look at his watch and he now sees that it's 12, 24, and four seconds. Four seconds have passed. And the thing is, Ryan knows that I always roll the ball at exactly three miles per hour. So Ryan can do some math and figure out that he is exactly 17.6 feet away from me. So now he knows that he's 17.6 feet away from me. He still doesn't know where he is, but he knows that he's 17.6 feet away from me. But this doesn't really tell Ryan much. Ryan is still sad because he doesn't know where he is. Sad. But this is where Helena comes in. Now, Helena and Ryan will repeat the exact same experiment we just did. Helena will look at her watch and see that it is now 1225 and zero seconds. Helena will write that on the ball and then roll it over to Ryan. Ryan picks up the ball, looks at his watch, and sees that it is now 1225 and five seconds. This time, five seconds have passed. Again, Helena rolls the ball at exactly three miles per hour, so Ryan can do some math and figure out that she must be 22 feet away. So now there's another circle of possibilities where Ryan could be. Now, these two pieces of information by themselves don't really tell Ryan much, but when you put them together, you find that in order to satisfy the information given by both me and Helena, Ryan either has to be here or here. Those are the only two points that make sense for Ryan to be. And because we know Ryan is on Ryan's world, he can't be out here floating in the ether of our mini universe. So Ryan must be right here. That is the only point that makes sense for him to be. He is 17.6 feet away from me, 22 feet away from Helena, and he is in Ryan's world. And now Ryan is happy because he knows where he is. Tremendous. Now in the real world, Ryan would be somewhere on Earth and Helena and I would be satellites orbiting around Earth. Now instead of sending basketballs from space, the satellites would broadcast or continuously beam these radio waves back down to Earth so that Ryan could receive them on his phone. 
Now, these radio waves are very specific frequencies, 1,228 and 1,575 megahertz. That way your phone doesn't confuse the GPS signal with a Sirius XM radio show. And encrypted within those signals is the exact, and I mean the exact, time. That's why I said in the beginning of the video that each satellite is equipped with an extremely accurate atomic clock. A clock so accurate they only lose or gain about one second every 100 million years. So not exact, but really, really close. So when a satellite broadcasts a signal, it sends information about which satellite it is, where it is, and the time that the signal was sent. But what about the speed of the signal? Ryan knew that I was rolling the basketball at three miles per hour. But what about radio waves? Well, all radio waves travel at the same speed, the speed of light, which we have measured and defined to be exactly 299,792,458 meters per second, or about 186,000 miles per second. So yeah, pretty fast. But there's another problem with this Ryan's World analogy. In order for this process to work, both my watch and Ryan's watch have to be perfectly synced together. And you can see why. If Ryan's watch is two minutes too fast, it won't work. If it took me four seconds to roll the ball to him, he will think it took two minutes and four seconds to roll the ball over to him. And in reality, there's always gonna be some difference between your phone's clock and a satellite's clock. Now, smartphones use something called quartz clocks, and quartz clocks are pretty accurate. They only lose or gain about 20 seconds every month, but that's still not accurate enough. Now, because radio waves travel at the speed of light, and the speed of light is really, really fast, tiny differences in the time can create huge differences in GPS position. Now, your phone's clock is updated to a more accurate clock several times per day, but that's still not accurate enough. To give you an idea of the accuracy required for this job, consider this. Say you update your phone's clock to the GPS satellite clock right now. Okay, now one second later, you want to use GPS. You wanna find out where you are. You will find that after just one second of not updating the clock, your GPS position could be as much as a mile and a half off your actual location. Think about that, a mile and a half off for just one second of not updating your clock. That is a huge difference. So how do you fix this problem? Well, let's expand this up to a 3D model to see. Let's say that this blue ball here is the Earth, and Ryan is somewhere on the Earth. And let's say that this little pale red dot is me, Satellite Ben. So let's say that the clock on Ryan's phone measures that it takes 4.7 seconds for my signal to reach him. That means, based on this information and knowing that radio waves travel at the speed of light, that Ryan is somewhere on this pink sphere. Notice how this is a sphere and not just a circle since we're now in a three-dimensional world. So Ryan could be here, or here, or here, just anywhere on the sphere. Think of the sphere as a range of possibilities for where Ryan could be. But here's the thing. There's always going to be a slight time difference between the clock in Ryan's phone and the clock in Satellite Ben. So because we don't know what the time difference between the two clocks is, this sphere of possibilities could be any size. Ryan could be on this sphere, or this sphere, or this sphere, or this one, or this one, or this one, or anything in between. So Ryan really could be anywhere. Satellite Ben by itself doesn't tell us anything about Ryan's location. So this is where Satellite Helena comes in. Satellite Helena is right here, and let's say that Ryan's phone measures Helena's radio signal to take 5 seconds to travel to him. So based off this information, Ryan is somewhere on this sphere. But again, there's the issue of timing, and since we know the clocks aren't perfectly in sync, it looks like we run into the same problem again. Ryan could be on this sphere, or this sphere, or this sphere, or anything in between. So how can we fix this problem? Well, let's first just say that the clocks are perfectly in sync. If this were true, then we would know a little bit more about Ryan's location. He must be on both spheres, therefore he must be on the intersection of these two spheres, which is a circle. So Ryan is somewhere on this circle. So now if we toggle through the range of possible time differences so that the clocks are a little out of sync, you can see that Ryan could be on this circle, or this circle, or this circle, or anything in between. So this narrows our options down quite a bit. We now know that Ryan exists somewhere on this collection of circles and that collection of circles actually creates this wide double cone. So we now know that Ryan is somewhere on this blue double cone. So let's see what happens when we add another satellite, Satellite Remy. 
Ryan measures satellite Remy's radio signal to take 4.4 seconds to reach him. So again, let's temporarily assume that the clocks are perfectly in sync. We know based off satellite Ben and satellite Helena that Ryan is somewhere on this blue circle. And now we know from satellite Remy that Ryan is somewhere on this sphere. So we can again take the intersection of these two. So Ryan must either be on point A or point B. And because point A is the point closer to Earth, where we know Ryan is, we can eliminate point B and just focus on point A. So again, now as we go through the possible time differences, we see that this forms this path of possibilities. That's another step better. Now let's add one more satellite, Satellite Sarah, and see what happens. Ryan measures Satellite Sarah's signal to take 5.13 seconds to reach him. And now we know that Ryan must be somewhere on this dark red sphere. So we need point A to line up with this sphere. And as I toggle the slider for the possible time differences, we can then see that only one value for a time difference works, 0.7 seconds. So finally, we find that Ryan's clock is 0.7 seconds off, and that he must be right here, right on point A. And that is the only place on Earth that satisfies the four time requirements for the radio signals being sent from each of the four satellites to Ryan. So, Ryan's GPS receiver would show him as a dot right there on point A. Wow. That took a while. But of course, it's not all that simple. There are so many complications that make determining your position even more complicated. To start, there's the timekeeping. As it turns out, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, time goes slower in a higher gravity. I'll say that again. Time passes slower in a higher gravity. That's a really weird concept to wrap your head around, but it's true. Time fluctuates depending on your local gravity. And because the GPS satellites are in space, a lower gravitational field, time passes quicker for them than what we measure here on Earth. The effect is incredibly tiny. It will only be off by about a second every hundred years, but it's enough to mess with the atomic clocks aboard the GPS satellites and cause massive GPS inaccuracies. So before the satellites were launched, the atomic clocks were calibrated to counteract this effect. Now Einstein's special theory of relativity plays into this as well, because when you're moving quickly, such as a satellite zooming around the Earth, time goes ever so slightly slower. Again, that's a really weird concept to think about, but it creates a noticeable effect. So the atomic clocks aboard the satellites have to be calibrated to counteract this effect as well. And beyond that, GPS monitor stations are located around the world operated by the United States Naval Observatory, and they continue to beam up new information to the satellite. For example, they monitor how much time the satellite's clocks have drifted by comparing them to clocks on other satellites as well as some atomic clocks on the ground. The monitor stations also track where the satellites are and send updates on the satellite's position, basically telling the satellite, you are here. And the stations also send up information on the satellite's orbit, including its inclination, eccentricity, semi-major axis, true anomaly, right ascension of the ascending node, and the argument of perigee. If you're interested in what those terms mean, you can look for a link in the description explaining those. And to add even more, the way the radio signals get to you can also vary. For example, radio waves travel slightly slower through the atmosphere. So depending on what angle the satellite makes with the Earth and you, that can change the amount of atmosphere the signal has to go through, which changes the time it takes for the signal to get to you, which can interfere with your location. And furthermore, variations in the ionosphere, the layer of electrons and ions above our atmosphere, can also affect your location. And these things called space hurricanes, essentially big swirling masses of plasma above the atmosphere, can also interfere with the location. And radio waves can also bounce off things like buildings or trees and mess up your location too. And then there's this thing called the Doppler shift, which means that depending on whether the satellite is moving toward or away from you, that can change how the signal gets spread out. So GPS receivers have to correct for this as well. As you might imagine, it can take quite a while to calculate all of this. Even for your phone, it takes a few seconds each time it recalculates your position. So if you're moving in a car, for example, your phone has to make guesses about where it thinks you will be during the time it recalculates. So if I'm driving along a road, for example, my phone will think, well, he's probably gonna keep driving along that road and not crash off to the side. So my phone will show the blue dot smoothly moving along the road. 
and my phone will still recalculate as often as it can to make sure its prediction was accurate. But if I run around in random directions on this football field with my phone, it's going to have no idea what's going on, so it's going to be kind of inaccurate. So there you have it. That is the absurd complexity of how your phone locates where you are. For something that seems relatively simple, it's incredible how complicated the system is. And the GPS system isn't only used for tracking your location, but because of their extremely accurate atomic clocks, they can also be used for validating your credit card, uh, traffic lights, and for timestamping financial transactions, both on Wall Street and in banking accounts. So the next time you use your phone to navigate around town or buy something with your credit card or watch a traffic light turn from red to green, take a moment and think about the satellites up in the sky, the signals they send, the computer chip in your phone, the staffed monitor stations around the world, and all the engineers and physicists who made the system possible. It really is incredible when you think about it. I want to thank Dr. Jude Levine from the National Institute of Standards and Technology for taking his time to speak with me over Zoom and for explaining how GPS works as well as how the atomic clocks aboard GPS satellites work. Thank you so much. Your help was greatly appreciated. Uh, and if you haven't seen my videos on clocks, I encourage you to go check those out. I have one on quartz clocks. That's the clocks used in everyday appliances like phones. And I have another video on how atomic clocks work, the clocks used in GPS satellites. Uh, you can subscribe to On the Shoulders of Science by clicking here, or you can watch one of those videos on clocks by clicking here. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.